John Wayne Gacy was an American serial killer and sex offender known as the Killer Clown, who assaulted and murdered at least 33 young men and boys. Gacy regularly performed at children's hospitals and charitable events as Pogo the Clown or Patches the Clown, personas he had devised. He was also active in his local community as a Democratic Party precedent captain and building contractor. According to Gacy, all of his murders were committed inside his ranch house near Norwich, a village in Norwood Park, metropolitan Chicago, Illinois. Typically, he would lure a victim to his home dupe him into donning handcuffs on the pretext of demonstrating a magic trick, and then rape and torture his captive before killing him either by asphyxiation or strangulation. Twenty-six victims were buried in the crawl space of his home, and three others were buried elsewhere on his property. Four were discarded in the Des Plaines River, Gacy was convicted of the sodomy of a teenage boy in Waterloo, Iowa in 1968 and was sentenced to 10 years imprisonment, but only served 18 months. He murdered his first victim in 1972, had murdered twice more by the end of 1975, and at least 30 subsequent victims were killed after his divorce from his second wife in 1976. The investigation into the disappearance of Des Plaines teenager Robert Piest led to Gacy's arrest on December 21, 1978. His conviction for 33 murders was the most by one individual in the United States history at the time. Gacy was sentenced to death on March 13, 1980, on death row at Minard Correctional Center. He spent much of his time painting. He was executed by lethal injection at Stateville Correctional Center on May 10, 1994. Let's take a look at his early life. During Gacy's childhood, he was very close to his mothers and two sisters, but endured a difficult relationship with his father, an alcoholic who was physically abusive to his wife and children. His father also belittled him, calling him dumb and stupid and comparing him unfavorably with his sisters. His mother tried to shield her son from his father's abuse, which only resulted in accusations that he was a sissy and a mama's boy. Despite his mistreatment, Gary still loved his father, but he felt he was never good enough in his father's eyes. In 1949, Gacy's father was informed his son and other boy had been caught sexually fondling a young girl. His father whipped him with a razor strop as punishment. The same year, a family friend and contractor would sometimes molest Gacy in his truck. Gacy never told his father about this, afraid that his father would blame him. Gacy was an overweight and unathletic child. Because of a heart condition, he was told to avoid all sports at school. During the fourth grade, Gacy began to experience blackouts. He was hospitalized on occasion because of seizures and in 1957 for a burst appendix. Gacy later estimated that between the ages of 14 and 19, he had spent almost a year in the hospital and attributed the decline of his grades to missing school. His father suspected these episodes were an effort to gain sympathy and attention and openly accused his son of faking the condition as the boy lay in the hospital bed. Although his mother, sisters, and close friends never doubted his illness, Gacy's medical condition was never conclusively diagnosed. Once in 1957, one of Gacy's friends witnessed Gacy's father shouting at his son for no reason, and then began hitting him. 
When Gacy's mother attempted to intervene, Gacy simply put up his hands to defend himself, adding that he never struck his father back during these altercations. When Gacy was slightly older, he decided to drive to Las Vegas, Nevada. He found work within the ambulance service before he was transferred to work as an attendant at Palm Mortuary. As a mortuary attendant, Gacy slipped on a cot behind the embalming room. He worked there for three months, observing morticians and embalming dead bodies. He later confessed that one evening, while alone, he had clambered into the coffin of a deceased teenage man, embracing and caressing the body before experiencing a sense of shock. This prompted Gacy to call his mother the next day and see if his father would allow him to return home. His father agreed, and the same day he drove back to Chicago. Upon returning home, Gacy enrolled at the Northwestern Business College. Despite failing to graduate from high school, he graduated from college in 1963 and took a management training position with the Nunn Bush Shoe Company. In 1964, the shoe company transferred him to Springfield, Illinois to work as a salesman and eventually promoted him to manager of his department. In March of that year, he became engaged to Marilyn Myers, a co-worker. During a courtship, Gacy joined the local JCs and worked tirelessly for them. Named Key Man in 1964, the same year he had his second homosexual experience. According to Gacy, after one of his colleagues in the Springfield Jaycees plied him with drinks and invited him to spend the evening on a sofa, he agreed. The colleague then performed oral sex on him while he was drunk. By 1965, Gacy had risen to the position of vice president of the Springfield Jaycees. Talk about a promotion. The same year, he was named the third most outstanding J.C. in the state of Illinois. KFC Manager After a six-month courtship, Gacy and Myers married in September 1964. Marilyn's father subsequently purchased three Kentucky Fried Chicken restaurants in, in Waterloo, Iowa, and the couple moved there so he could manage the restaurants. With the understanding that they would move into Marilyn's parents' home, vacated for the couple. The offer was lucrative. Gacy would receive $15,000 per year, the equivalent of $115,513 as of 2020, plus a share of the restaurant's profits. Following the obligatory completion of a management course, Gary relocated to Waterloo with his wife. He opened a club in his basement where his employees could drink alcohol and play pool. Although Gacy employed teenagers of both sexes as restaurants, he socialized only with the young men. Gacy gave many of them alcohol before he made sexual advances. If they rebuffed him, he would claim his advances were simply jokes or a test of morale. Gacy's wife gave birth to a son in 1966 and a daughter in 1967. Gacy himself later described this period of his life as perfect. He had finally earned his father's approval. When Gacy's parents visited in July 1966, his father apologized for this abuse and said, Son, I was wrong about you. The Assault of Donald Voorhees in August of 1967, Gacy sexually assaulted 15-year-old Donald Voorhees, the son of a fellow J.C. Gacy lured Voorhees to his house, having promised to show him pornographic films. Gacy plied Voorhees with alcohol and persuaded him to perform oral sex. Over the following months, Gacy similarly abused several other youths, including one whom Gacy encouraged to have sex with his own wife before blackmailing him into performing oral sex on him. Gacy tricked several teenagers into believing he was commissioned to conduct homosexual experiments in the interest of scientific research, and paid them up to $50 each. 
In March 1968, Voorhees reported to his father that Gacy had sexually assaulted him. Voorhees Sr. immediately informed the police who arrested Gacy and subsequently charged him with performing oral sodomy on Voorhees and the attempted assault of 16-year-old Edward Lynch. Gacy vehemently denied the charges and demanded to take a polygraph test. The results indicated Gacy was nervous when he denied any wrongdoing in relation to both men. Gacy publicly denied any wrongdoing and insisted the charges against him were politically motivated. After these events, Gacy decided to move back to Chicago as he was not welcome in his town anymore. With financial assistance from his mother, Gacy bought a ranch house near the village of Norwich in Norwood Park Township, an unincorporated area of Cook County, a part of metropolitan Chicago. The address, 8213 West Somerdale Avenue, is where he resided until his arrest in December of 1978, and where, according to Gacy, he committed all of his brutal murders. Gacy was active in his local community. His neighbors considered him helpful. He willingly loaned his construction tools and plowed snow from neighborhood walks free of charge. Between 1974 and 78, he hosted annual summer parties attended by hundreds of people, including politicians. Second Marriage and Divorce In August of 1971, shortly after Gacy and his mother moved into the house, he became engaged to Carol Hoff, a divorcee with two young daughters. They were married on July 1st, 1972. His fiancée and stepdaughters moved into his home soon after their announcement of their engagement. Gacy's mother moved out of the house shortly before the wedding. By 1975, Gacy had told his wife that he was bisexual. After the couple had sex on Mother's Day that year, he informed her that this would be the last time they would ever have sex. He began spending most evenings away from home, only to return in the early hours of the morning with the excuse he had been working late. His wife observed Gacy bringing teenage boys into his garage and found gay pornography and men's wallets and identification inside the house. When she confronted Gacy about who these items belonged to, he informed her angrily that it was none of her business. Following a heated argument when she failed to balance a checkbook correctly in October of 1975, Carol Gacy asked her husband for a divorce. He agreed to his wife's request, although by mutual consent. Carol continued to live at 8213 West Somerdale until February of 1976, when she and her daughters moved into their own apartment. Gacy has been well known as a clown killer. Through his membership in a local moose club, Gacy became aware of a Jolly Joker clown club, whose members regularly performed at fundraising events and parades in addition to voluntarily entertaining hospitalized children. In late 1975, Gacy joined and created his own clown characters. Pogo the Clown, and Patches the Clown. He described Pogo as a happy clown, whereas Patches was a more serious character. Gacy seldom earned money for his performances and later said that acting as a clown allowed him to regress into childhood. He performed as both Pogo and Patches at numerous local parties, political functions, charitable events, and children's hospitals. Sometimes Gacy would remain in his clothing clowning garb after a performance and briefly drink at a local bar before returning home. Gacy's voluntary public service as a clown throughout the years of his murders led him to being known as the Clown Killer. The Murder of Timothy McCoy Gacy's first known murder occurred on January 2, 1972, According to Gacy's later account, following a family party, he decided to drive to the Civic Center in the Loop 
to view a display of ice sculptures before luring a 16-year-old named Timothy Jack McCoy from Chicago's Greyhound bus terminal into his car. McCoy was traveling from Michigan to Omaha, Nebraska. Gacy took McCoy on a sightseeing tour of Chicago and then drove him to his home with the premise that he could spend the night and be driven back to the station in time to catch the bus. Gacy claimed he woke up the following morning to find McCoy standing in his bedroom with a kitchen knife in his hand. He jumped from his bed and McCoy raised both arms in a gesture of surrender. Tilting the knife upwards and accidentally cutting Gacy's forearm. Gacy twisted the knife from McCoy's wrist, banged his head against the bedroom wall, kicked him against his wardrobe and walked towards him. McCoy then kicked Gacy in the stomach, doubling him over. Gacy grabbed McCoy, wrestled him to the floor, and stabbed him repeatedly in the chest as he straddled him. As McCoy lay dying, Gacy claimed he washed the knife in his bathroom, then went to the kitchen and saw an open carton of eggs and a slab of unsliced bacon on his kitchen table. McCoy had also set the table for two. He had walked into Gacy's room to wake him while absentmindedly carrying a kitchen knife in his hand. So it had somewhat been accidental, Gacy claimed. Gacy buried McCoy in his crawl space and later covered his grave with a layer of concrete. In an interview several years after his arrest, Gacy said that he felt totally drained after killing McCoy yet noted that as he stabbed McCoy and listened to the gurgulations and gasping for air, he experienced pleasure. He added, that's when I realized that death was the ultimate thrill. Gacy said that the second time he committed murder was around January 1974. The victim remains unidentified. Gacy strangled him and then placed the body in his closet before burial. He later stated that bodily fluids leaked from the victim's mouth and nose, staining his carpet. As a result, Gacy regularly stuffed cloth rags, or his own underwear, in the mouths of subsequent victims to prevent this leakage from occurring. The Cruising Years In addition to being the year his business expanded, Gacy freely admitted that 1975 was also when he began to increase the frequencies of his excursions for sex with young males. He often referred to these jaunts as cruising. He committed the most of his murders between 1960, I mean 1976 and 78, as he largely lived alone following his divorce. One neighbor later recollected that for several years, the sounds of muffled, high-pitched screaming, shouting, and crying had repeatedly wakened her and her son in the morning hours. She identified the sounds as emanating from a house adjacent to theirs on Somerdale Avenue. The Murder of Robert Peast On the afternoon of December 11th, 1978, Gacy visited the Nissan Pharmacy on Des Plaines to discuss a potential remodeling deal with the store owner, Phil Torf, while he was within the earshot of a 15-year-old part-time employee, Robert Pierce. Gacy mentioned his firm often hired teenage boys at a starting wage of $5 per hour, almost double the pay that Pierce earned at the pharmacy. Shortly after he left, Peace's mother arrived at the store to drive her son home so they could celebrate her birthday together. Peace asked his mother to wait, adding that a contractor wants to talk to him about a job. He left the store at 9 p.m., promising to return shortly. Peace was murdered shortly after 10 p.m. at Gacy's home. Gacy later stated that at his house, he asked Peace if there was anything he wouldn't do for the right price, to which Peace replied that he didn't mind working hard. In response, Gacy stated that good money could be earned by hustling, although Peace was dismissive. 
an investigation. When Peace failed to return, his family filed a missing person report with the Des Plaines Police. Torf named Gacy as the contractor he said most likely left the store to talk to about a job. Lieutenant Joseph Kozanak, whose son attended Maine West School, like Peast, chose to investigate Gacy further. Having spoken with Peast's mother on the morning of December 12th, Kozanak became convinced Peast had not run away from home. A routine check of Gacy's criminal background revealed that he had an outstanding battery charge against him in Chicago and had served a prison sentence in Iowa for the sodomy of a 12-15 year old boy. Kozanak and two Des Plaines police officers visited Gacy at his home the following evening. Gacy indicated that he had seen two youths working at the pharmacy and that he had asked one of them, whom he believed to be pieced whether there were any remodeling materials behind the store. He was adamant, however, that he had not offered Peace a job and had only returned to the pharmacy shortly after 8, as he had left his appointment book at the store. Gacy promised to come to the station later that evening to make a statement confirming this, indicating he was unable to do so at the moment because his uncle had just died. When questioned as to how soon he would come to the police station, he responded, You guys are very rude. Don't you have any respect for the dead? At 3.20 a.m., Gacy arrived at the police station, covered in mud, claiming he had been involved in a car accident. On returning to the police station later that day, Gacy denied any involvement from Peace disappearance and repeated that he had not offered him a job. When asked why he returned to the pharmacy, he reiterated that it had been done in response to a phone call from Torf, informing him that he had left his appointment book at the store. Detectives had already spoken to Torf, who denied calling Gacy. At the request of detectives, Gacy prepared a written statement detailing his movements on December 11th. Confession On the evening of December 20th, Gacy drove to his lawyer's office in Park Ridge to attend a scheduled meeting, ostensibly to discuss the progress of his civil suit. On his arrival, Gacy appeared disheveled and immediately asked for an alcoholic drink, whereupon his lawyer fetched a bottle of whiskey from his car. On his return, he asked him what he had discussed with them. Gacy picked up a copy of the Daily Herald from his desk, pointed to a front-page article covering the disappearance of Robert Piest and said, This boy is dead. He's in a river. He then proceeded to give a rambling confession that ran into the early hours of the following morning. He informed his lawyers that he had been the judge, jury, and executioner of many, many people and that he now wanted to be the same for himself. He said that he had buried most of his victims in his crawl space and had disposed of five other bodies in the Des Plaines Rivers. He dismissed his victims as male prostitutes, hustlers, and liars to whom he gave the rope trick, adding that he sometimes awoke to found dead strangled kids on his floor with their hands behind their backs. He had buried their bodies in his crawl space as he believed they were his property. With this information, police were able to get a signed search warrant. Police and evidence technicians drove to Gacy's home. Upon their arrival, officers found that Gacy had unplugged his sump, his sump pump, flooding the crawl space with water to clear it. They simply replaced the plug and waited for the water to drain. After it had done so, evidence technician Daniel Ginty entered the crawl space, crawled to the southwest area, and began digging. Within minutes, he had uncovered putrefied flesh and a human arm bone. Immediately, he shouted to the investigators that they could charge Gacy with murder, adding, I think this place is full of kids. A police photographer then dug in the northeast corner of the crawl space, uncovering a patella. The two then began digging in the southeast corner, 
on covering two of the lower leg bones. Trial. Gacy was brought to trial on February 6, 1980. He was charged with 33 murders. He underwent a variety of psychological tests before a panel of psychiatrists to determine whether he was mentally competent to stand trial. Gacy attempted to convince the doctors that he suffered from multiple personality disorder. During the fifth week of the trial, Gacy wrote a personal letter to the judge requesting a mistrial for a number of reasons, including that he did not approve of his lawyer's insanity plea, that his lawyers did not allow him to take the witness stand, and that his defense had not called enough medical witnesses. The judge addressed Gacy's letter by informing him that both counsels had not been denied the opportunity or funds to summon experts to testify, and that under the law he had the choice whether he wished to testify, and was free to do so if he, if he wanted to. In the sentencing phase of the trial, the jury deliberated for more than two hours before sentencing Gacy to death for each murder committed after the Illinois Statute on Capital Punishment came into effect on June 1977. His execution was set for June 2, 1980. While on death row, a fellow death row inmate stabbed Gacy in the upper arm with a sharpened wire. A second death row inmate injured in the attack received a superficial stab wound to the head. Both received treatment in the prison hospital for their wounds. On the morning of Gacy's execution, he was given a private picnic on the prison gowns, grounds with his family. For his last meal, he ordered a bucket of KFC, a dozen fried shrimp, french fries, fresh strawberries, and a Diet Coke. According to published reports, Gacy was a diagnosed psychopath who did not express any remorse at the time of his death for his crimes. His final statement to his lawyer before his execution was, Kiss my ass. In the hours leading up to his execution, a crowd estimated at over 1,000 gathered outside the correctional center. Some of those in favor of the execution wore t-shirts hearkening to Gacy's previous community services as a clown that many said, no tears for the clown. After Gacy's death was confirmed at 12.58 a.m. on May 10, 1994, his brain was removed. It is in possession of Helen Morrison, a witness for the defense at Gacy's trial, who has interviewed Gacy and other serial killers in an attempt to isolate common personality traits of violent sociopaths. His body was cremated. John Wayne Gacy was a truly deplorable man who took out his shortcomings on people who truly did not deserve it.